So the purpose of this webinar is to be able to complete a final project, which in this case is a complete autonomous solution. So whether you guys are students or teachers, um, the idea is that by the end of the webinar, you'll be able to program a robot like the one you can see on screen that just travels through a field by itself and performs a task like in this case, pushing uh, the blue object and the green object to the desired areas. The agenda for today is first, we're gonna be covering some concepts. So we're gonna give you guys an intro to robot autonomy. Um, after that, we're gonna explain to you how we're gonna be using simulations and how we're gonna be using graphical modeling to explain the concepts, uh, show you guys how to understand the autonomous tasks. And we're gonna be covering uh, a couple of autonomy tasks. Uh, to be specific, we're gonna be covering how to make a robot move for time, uh, also called temporal logic. We're gonna be covering how to do dead reckoning. And for that, we're gonna be implementing something called state machines. If you're not familiar with that, we're gonna be explaining all of those concepts throughout the webinar. Then we're gonna show you how to avoid obstacles, how to navigate uh, with motor encoders and with quadrature encoders, um, how to determine the position of your robots in the field, and how to control the position of the robots with something like a PID control. And in the end, we're gonna look at detecting objects. And all of this is gonna lead us to implementing our complete autonomous algorithm. And we're gonna have a summary and we're gonna give you guys a couple of resources in the slides that you can use to share with other students or if you're a coach to share with your students. Uh, to further learn about mobile robotics. So intro to robot autonomy. So if you are part of the VEX competition right now, you will likely already know or at least understand what driver control is. So driver control means um, completing a task, having your robot complete a task while a human is driving it. Um, that means that you have already designed the robot, you have completed them, the mechanical design of your robot. And now you have to uh, send commands to it to control the actuators. And these commands is what we call the remote control program. So this is the third stage of developing a robot to compete on the VAX competition. Now in this particular case, uh, the human or the driver would be um, taking care of other tasks such as sensing, in this case, looking at the field, evaluating where the robot is, uh, where the objects are, and also taking decisions. So should the robot move forward, move backwards? Should it grab something? Should it drop it? Um, now different to this, um, we wanna look at what is autonomous control. Autonomous control is having the robot complete the same tasks, but in this case, we're gonna be removing the human from the equation, uh, but we're still gonna be left with the same tasks that the human was performing. So in this case, we still need to sense the environment, we still need to take decisions and send commands to the robot. And this is what ultimately goes into something like the VEX microcontroller. And this is what we call autonomy program. Now autonomy programming um, fits specifically within a robotic system. Now in our robotic system, you're gonna have your autonomy programming, which is gonna be programming your microcontroller, uh, but you are also gonna have the rest of your robot to interact with. Now this means that these microcontrollers are gonna be receiving some inputs. In this case, we might be receiving some inputs from our sensors, which might be contact sensors, bumper switches, the new vision sensor, an ultrasonic distance finder, or an encoder. And that also means that the robot will be equipped with actuators that in this case can be uh, motors or something like a solenoid trigger. Uh, so we're gonna be covering some information on how to program both VEX EDR motors and VEX V5 motors. Um, now, this brings up a question, which is, 
which are the components of an autonomous mode algorithm. So we have an idea that it's sensing, deciding, and commanding. So what are ultimately all the components that we need to program? So to look at it in more detail, uh, on the sensing portion, this is something that in, in, robot, in the robotics industry is commonly uh, known as the perception. So this is gonna be your robot perception. And what it means is that it processes all the sensor information into useful data, such as range sensing, position tracking, or object sensing. And in the decision portion, we can split up the different portions of the algorithms in two different levels, a high level and a low level. The high level we usually call supervision, and this mostly handles the task scheduling, so how to execute one task after the other, um, the reactions, in case something is happening in the field that is unexpected that you need to react to, and things like the map navigation and having different operating modes. On the low level, the decisions that are taken are usually referred to as control. Uh, control is usually designated as the algorithm that ultimately calculates the actuator commands. And some of these algorithms can be moving for time. Uh, this is based on time. They can be on-off algorithms uh, based on simple logic, or they can be a more advanced PID control. And the fourth uh, portion of an autonomous mode algorithm is the actuation. And this deals with integrating and interfacing with all the actuators and the hardware in your robot. In this case, it might be setting the motor speeds, or uh, sending the triggers to your solenoids if you have a pneumatic system. So all of these autonomous tasks that we're gonna be covering are gonna be uh, addressing specifically some of these autonomous mode components. So whether some of them are addressing perception specifically, supervision, control or actuation, uh, by the end of covering all of these tasks, we should have a good understanding of all of these, and we will be able to go into a complete autonomous solution uh, that's gonna contain all of these different components. And in this case, as we've seen, we're gonna navigate, we're gonna find, and we're gonna move objects to the respective target locations, and we're gonna do so by implementing some of the autonomous tasks that we're gonna learn throughout the webinar. So that's gonna be closed loop dead reckoning, wall following, detecting objects, and navigating the map. And as we've seen in, in the animation, the robot will be able to do all of these by itself. We're gonna be keeping track of which uh, autonomy components we're talking about uh, by these icons on the right. So, you can, you can look at those and make sure that you understand exactly what we're trying to explain in that portion of the webinar. And now we go into intro to simulations and model-based design. So the idea behind model-based design and simulations is that this is part of the engineering process. So how do engineers design autonomous algorithms? Um, well, this is a fairly standard recipe. They select the desired task to solve. Uh, then they evaluate the robot they have, they evaluate the instrumentation and the design to see what type of sensors it has um, and what type of actuators they have to work with. Then the engineers come up with strategies and requirements of how they wanna achieve the different tasks or how they wanna achieve the different goals. In this case, the goals is scoring for the competition and then once they have those requirements, they prototype an algorithm and they test it both in real life and using simulations. Uh, after they've tested the algorithm, they modify it, they make changes, uh, whether they're big or small to make sure that their algorithm is performing as they want. And finally, they deploy the tested algorithm to their hardware. Now, all of these concepts are covered in what's called model-based design, which means using only one platform or one model to be able to track down 
all of these actions. So from requirements to prototyping to deploying your algorithms to hardware. Now, in this workshop, we're gonna be covering specifically how to prototype the algorithms, simulate them, and then uh, program them into VEX microcontrollers. Uh, we're gonna be covering both uh, Simulink models in this case, uh, which is a graphical modeling approach. And we're also gonna be showing you VEX coding studio code. So we've also mapped um, scripts of code developed in VEX coding studio to show you how you would go about programming something like this in textual based programming. The simulations, uh, you can keep track of models and code by the icons that you can see on the left and right. So the simulations are mostly gonna be in Simulink, um, but the, the code that you can deploy to the VEX microcontrollers is gonna be both from the Simulink models and from the code that we have developed for the watch. So you might ask yourself, why use simulations at all? Why can't I just program my microcontroller every time and play with my robot? Uh, well, there are a couple of reasons. Um, the main one is we always get asked, uh, the VEX teams are usually divided in subteams, one of which is the programming subteam and one of which is the building subteam, so builders and programmers. And programmers generally don't have much of an option to play with the hardware until it's finished. So simulation gives them an option to start learning their programming environment to test um, basic low level algorithms or high level algorithms. And also if you have a simulation environment where you can try some algorithms, you're gonna prevent damage and wear to the heart, in this case to your role. And in most cases, running a simulation in a computer is probably gonna be faster than uh, making sure you have your batteries charged or getting access to, to a VEX field. And you can do it at your own pace and in your own computer. Now we're gonna go over the differences between code and Simulink. And we're gonna do this by covering tank control. So tank control is generally when you try to control a left and right motors in a robot with uh, something like a left and right joystick in a controller. So in text-based algorithms, uh, usually we favor sequential execution, which is the most common. And dynamic execution is a little bit le least common. Um, on the bottom right, we're gonna see a portion of code that would uh, be how we implement tank control in, in a programming environment such as VEX Coding Studio. In this case, we are grabbing the inputs from the controller axes, and then we are setting those as the velocities for the left and right motors to spin. Uh, the difference with something like Simulink, which is a graphical modeling approach, is that in Simulink, um, the models are non-sequential execution. What this means is that, um, as you can see in this Simulink model and screen, you have a couple of blocks in the canvas, you can connect the joystick directly to a motor, uh, or in this case, invert the signal of the joystick to the left motor. Um, but it means that all of these blocks are gonna be running at a set sample time. And this means that the complete algorithm runs at set intervals. Um, this means that the algorithm will run a couple times a second or a couple hundred times a second, depending on what the sample time is for that model. And the simulation environment that we're gonna be using today to demonstrate the concepts and the tasks that we are gonna show you how to solve, it's called the Robotics Playground and it's basically a library of simulating blocks that allows you to get a visualization for a differential drive robot like the one you see on screen. Um, so you can use simulating blocks like a left motor and a right motor to set the speeds of the left and right wheels. So some of the visualizations that we're gonna see today are gonna be uh, using the robotics player. And without further ado, we're gonna start showing you how to solve some autonomy tasks. And we're gonna start with moving for time. So um, moving for time is often referred to as temporal logic. And all this means is that it's time-based. Um, 
when you're trying to move for time, what you do is you set your motor speeds, um, you wait for a specific period of time, and then maybe you set your motor to stop or you go into a different state. Uh, this is related to the autonomy component of actuation. Um, so we are gonna be setting motor commands and waiting for a specific period of time. Like you can see on the video, in this case, the robot has traveled a specific distance. We just don't know what distance that is because all we know is that it traveled for a specific amount of time. And you can do this obviously by programming either VEX V5 motors or VEX EDR motors. And now we're gonna take a look at how this looks in code. So on the left, you can see under the code icon, um, how to do something like this on the VEX Coding Studio. So the first two statements are gonna be setting the velocity for the motors, and then we're gonna actually tell the motors to spin in the forward direction. Um, then we are telling the overall environment to sleep. So it's just gonna wait for, in this case, 3000 milliseconds. So that's gonna be three seconds. And after three seconds, the motors are gonna stop. So giving us the behavior that we just saw. Uh, in Simulink, on the other hand, because uh, we don't have this sequential execution that we have on a scripting language, we are gonna have to compare uh, the time that has passed since the robot started moving. In this case, we're gonna use a clock for that. And if the time is greater than three seconds, we are gonna send a signal of zero to the motors, which means that they're gonna stop the robot from moving. And if the signal, uh, if the clock, or in this case, the time is less than three seconds, we are gonna send a command in this case of 120 to make sure that the robot moves well. So what are the pros and cons of um, a moving for time algorithm? Uh, the pros are that it's obviously very easy to implement. All you have to do is set your motor speeds and then make sure your robot is waiting enough time to reach whatever point you wanna get to. Uh, but there are a couple of cons for this algorithm. And one of them is that it halts code execution. It means that while you're executing that sleep uh, statement, nothing else can happen. And in an autonomous mode algorithm where uh, you might only have 30 seconds to complete a couple of different actions, uh, those are valuable seconds that you're gonna be losing, uh, waiting for something else to happen until you can move into the, ne the next task. Uh, this means no parallel tasks. Also, we don't know what the distance traveled is, so there's a lot of trial and error and um, testing involved in getting the right, um, the right time to set for your algorithm to sleep. And the third con is that it, because it's hard coded, it's not gonna be easily reusable. It means that every time you're gonna have to go out and test to see how long it takes for your robot to reach a particular location. And that brings us on to our next autonomy task that we'll be covering, and that is dead reckoning. Now, dead reckoning is generally referred to as when a robot moves to a position that is relative to its starting location. So in this case, we want our robot to move forward and then left, because that's the point that we wanna achieve. And we can do that by having a sequence of individual motor commands that execute one after the other. In this case, as you can see in the flowchart in the screen, um, you, we are gonna wanna move forward first, then we're gonna want our robot to turn left, then it's gonna move forward again, and finally it's gonna stop. So let's take a look at um, how you're supposed to code something like this and something like the coding studio. Um, it is very similar to what we just covered in moving for time, as in the sense that you're gonna be reusing this setting of the motor commands. The only difference is that we're gonna copy that code and we're gonna have different inputs. So as you can see on the, on the blue box, it's exactly the same that we had before. And then we copy and pasted that below it and all we did was 
we change the direction of rotation of one of the motors to be in reverse. And then it waited for another three seconds. And you can keep doing this and adding as many sequences as you want to your algorithm until, in this case, we're going to have the robot stop. Um, so what are the pros of implementing um, sequential programming like this? Well, again, easy to implement. Doesn't take more than a couple of seconds to copy your code and paste it and change a couple of numbers. Um, but in the long run, this might not be the best use of your time since it's one gonna lead to lots of code and um, your memory usage is gonna be important on your microcontroller, in this case, the Bex brain. So if you make code that is too big to even compile to go on the microcontroller, then that is not very useful. And then the second con for that is that, again, you can't perform any parallel tasks while this is happening. So you're limited to performing one task at a time as it waits uh, during those leap cycles. Um, a more efficient way to perform sequential programming, as we mentioned before, is using a state machine. Um, so in, in simulating state machines are generally programmed using charts. And since we don't yet know what state machines or charts are, we are gonna be covering these topics conceptually first, starting with state machines. So what is a state machine? Um, a state machine is a programming concept um, that comes from event-based programming. Uh, it, basically just means a specific way to wrap code or to write your code. And it's been widely adopted uh, both in industrial automation and in consumer robotics. And state machines are useful specifically for the autonomy component of supervision. Um, and as we know, supervision makes part of scheduling the tasks that your robot is gonna be performing throughout the autonomous mode. The state machines are most popular in systems that have multiple modes of operation. So let's take the example of a lamp or a light bulb that turns on and off. Uh, it's always oscillating between two different states. It's either on or it's off. Um, and it might be doing this, um, this might be happening depending on an action or an event. Uh, so in this case, a uh, lamp can be turned on by pressing a button and maybe by pressing the same button, we're gonna be turning it off. The idea behind state machines is that you're gonna have states and transitions or actions, and that the different states are gonna transition between them uh, given these uh, events that happen. So let's go through a brief example to make this more clear. Let's take a traffic light. Traffic light has three very specific states, it can be red, yellow, or green, and these events have to happen in a predetermined sequence. So it might start green, go to yellow after a specific amount of time, then go to red, and then go back to green. Um, so this is a perfect example of a state machine because it's a predetermined sequence and because it repeats indefinitely. So why should we use a state machine? Uh, state machines are useful because they allow us to reuse code. Uh, so the two main reasons to use a state machine is reusing code and solving cyclic problems. So cyclic problems means something that repeats. So anything that might involve you copy pasting the same portion of code is a good candidate for putting it on a state machine. So we're gonna take a look at the example of two repeating actions, uh, like the ones we've looked at so far. So if you wanna, let's say, move forward and then move backwards to the same spot, you, if you do that once, you're gonna be copying your code once, but if you wanna do that repeatedly, you're gonna to have to be copying that code multiple times, and then you're gonna end up with very extensive code. What a state machine allows you to do instead is that you're gonna write a state or a specific portion of code that you're then gonna wrap into an event. So you're gonna be using transitions, so you're gonna be using some logic to change in, in between two different portions of an algorithm. 
And if you see this icon throughout the presentation, that is the icon that's uh, surrounded by green. That's gonna be representing that we are using or we are showing you a state machine. So what are some other benefits of using state machines? As we said before, indefinite execution, but state machines are gonna finally allow you to do parallel tasks. So this is gonna be something like having your robot move both forward and raising an arm during your autonomous mode. Uh, this can save you a lot of time. And also things like constant, constantly checking for safety conditions or constantly checking for other robots or hitting a wall and being able to react to this. Another benefit is reusing code. In this case, for example, a lot of BEX teams uh, will write state machines for the remote control operation, and then they're able to just reuse that for their autonomous mode uh, algorithms. And some more benefits are that in most cases, state machines are easier to debug, debug and they are more scalable. Some of the cons of a state machine, however, are that they are harder to hand code. Um, they will take more logic and conceptually they are more difficult to understand because it is no longer a sequence of event, but it can like go back and forth and jump between different states depending on the conditions. So now we're gonna revisit our autonomy task number two, that reckoning, but now we are gonna try to solve it using a state machine. Again, uh, this is likely something that you're gonna perform during an autonomous mode implementation in order to be able to perform multiple tasks at once, uh, even though it will not be running indefinitely. Uh, so we're gonna be right now solving the same problem that is moving forward, turning left, and then moving forward again and stopping. So how would you go about hand coding a state machine? Well, here is a recipe that you can use to do that. Uh, the first thing you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to set up your robot devices. In this case, because we're using two motors, we're gonna set up the left and right motors and set a velocity to them. Then we're gonna have to create some variables to keep track of the time and states of the state machine. In this case, we're creating an integer to keep track of the states and a double to keep track of time. Finally, all the different tasks that our robot will be performing are gonna be wrapped uh, in a switch state. So this switch statement uh, is going to allow you to change in between different portions of code. And in order for all of these to execute uh, at a constant rate, we're gonna have to set a sample time for your robot. Uh, this is also commonly referred to as the robot reaction time. And it just means how fast your robot's gonna be able to react to either your control inputs, or in this case, your sensors. So we've covered the overall architecture, but we haven't really seen what you should put inside the switch statement. So now we're gonna take a look at the switch statement. Uh, in each portion of the switch statement, you're gonna have, um, you can see that it repeats. So you're gonna have some similar conditions. And the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is set the necessary commands when you enter that particular state. In this case, we are telling the motors to spin, we are commanding them. We are commanding them to spin in the forward direction. And the next thing you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to keep track of time. If you're designing a temporal uh, logic algorithm in this case, uh, we're gonna increase the time or a timer that we have set up by whatever sample time we decided upon when we set up the architecture. So in this case, it's gonna be 0 0.05 seconds or 50 milliseconds. And then when we've increased the time, we can take decisions on whether or not we wanna stay in that state or exit and move into a different portion of the autonomous mode. So in this case, we're gonna be comparing to time so let's say if the time is greater than eight seconds, we are gonna to move to the next state. So that's where we're increasing the state counter in this case. Now you can see how in this particular task, we're already covering two different autonomous components. We're showing you how to perform the supervision of 
uh, multiple sequence of commands using a state machine and the actuation of your motors by uh, putting those commands within individual cases of the state machine. Now, let's take a look at how we can do this in something like Simulink and simulate it to understand what's happening with the robot. Uh, in Simulink, the programming is done using charts. Um, so now that we know exactly what a state machine is and what it's used for, we are going to look at what a Simulink chart is or a stateful chart. And that is, in this case, in the Simulink model that you see here, is the yellow box that is setting the motor velocities in this case. So you can see that there are signals coming out of it that are setting the right motor speed and the left motor speed. And we see that this is our dead reckoning sequence. So what might be inside of this chart? Throughout the webinar, you will see that the models are specified on the bottom. So if you want to go back and open up the models later, which we will be sharing with you guys, you can go back and look at this particular model. And this is what a um, sequential state machine looks like in state flow. Basically, um, we have a flow chart that we can create states and transitions in. So from the left to the right, we can see that it's pretty much like our conceptual diagram. Um, it's pretty much like our conceptual diagram that we derived when we were trying to explain what our dead reckoning sequence was going to be. So we are going to set our motors to move forward so left and right motors at a forward speed then we are going to wait for three seconds set our robots to our, our motors to turn right so we're going to invert one of those motors in this case the left to be negative 120 and we can see another transition that is going to wait for two seconds before moving forward again so this is what a state flow chart looks like and this is how we implement state machines in sim. So let's take a look at what this might look like in a simulating demonstration and why this is useful. And what we see here in the right is the visualization for, um, for our particular algorithm. So this is what our Simulink model looks like on the left. Um, you can see that we have the environment that we're gonna be using, which in this case, you can see the visualization on the right. And that we are setting this right and left motor speeds using this chart in which we can see the flow chart that I have just explained to you guys. So if we were to run this model, we would be able to look at the behavior on the right and also track down in which state the robot is currently at on the left by looking at the state flow chart. So we can see that it's currently moving forward and as the robot moves forward and approaches the wall, it then starts turning right and then it moves forward again and it will eventually come to a stop. So that was the simulating demo for dead reckoning with temporal watch. And in that we cover both simulink and state flow charts, which are um, visual based form of making a state machine. So you might wonder, uh, well, you mentioned that state machines are especially useful at solving cyclic or indefinite problems. Um, so we're going to cover a different example. In this case, we're going to make, uh, we're going to program a maze solving robot. So you can see here on screen this robot that is uh, walking or, or he's transversing through the maze that we've developed. And it can do so um, by implementing a state machine. Uh, before we program the robot, we have to determine how, what is the logic that we want it to implement. In this case, we know that our robot has two motors, two actuators, one on each wheel, 
left and right. And we have equipped it with three different distance sensors in three different directions. So we have a forward, a left, and a right facing distance sensors. And then we need to determine what are the necessary states for our state machine. In this case, uh, we're going to want to move forward, turn left, or turn right, depending on the conditions on which these uh, distance sensors are up. So this is what a Simulink model looks like for our maze solving robot. We have a state machine in the middle uh, that is being fed by some inputs. So the inputs are coming from our sensors, our front sensor, left sensor, and right sensor. And these sensors are feeding in distance information for each of these directions. Then we've implemented a state machine uh, via Stateflow in order to process these inputs from the sensors so that we can derive some left and right motor commands that are going to, in turn, uh, affect the behavior of our robot. Now, this is what our state machine looks like for the maze solving robot. Um, in this case, we start at the uh, move forward state by setting both motors to a positive velocity. And then we are checking both the front and the left and right distance sensors for a specific distance. And if we see an open space on the right, we're going to want to turn right. So that corresponds to um, having a left distance that is, in this case, less than one meter. Um, that means that there's an obstacle on the left. And the same if we have a right distance that's less than one meter, that means we have an obstacle on the right and that we should turn left. Uh, so then we will move into our turn left or turn right states and we will rotate a robot, we will turn. In this case, we're using temporal logic. So we're waiting for two seconds. And uh, finally, it's gonna go back to moving forward. So let's take a look at what this looks like uh, when it's executing in Simulink again. So here on the left, we have our Simulink model. You can see that we have our sensors on the left, our actuators on the right. And this is the state machine that we just looked at. So if we were to run this model, we should see our robot trying to uh, move through the maze. Uh, and in this case, it is useful because you can see how we only had to write code for three states. So if you were hand coding this, this would mean not having to hard code the actions of the robot like in this case, moving forward, turning right, turning right again, turning left, moving forward, and things like that. And here we can see the robot changing from the move forward state to the turn left, then moving forward again, and then once it sees a gap on the right, turning right, and it's gonna keep doing this as we saw on the initial animation until it gets to the end of the maze. We're gonna go ahead and stop that simulation and go back to our presentation. Um, so that should conclude our state machine portion of the webinar. So by now you should understand what a state machine is, why it is useful to implement it, uh, what are its advantages and its disadvantages. And um, you should probably consider looking a little bit more into this if you wanna be really competitive at your autonomous mode. Now moving on, we're gonna be looking at our autonomy task number three. And this task is avoiding obstacles. Uh, now, avoiding obstacles is relatively simple. Uh, in this case, it's come, this task deals with the autonomy components of perception, control, and actuation. And it means that we are going to be comparing a sensor reading uh, to a known distance threshold. 
uh, we're going to be taking the sensor reading, comparing it, and then we're going to be setting some motor speeds. Now it's important to note that you can also avoid obstacles by using bumper and limit switches. So bumper switches and limit switches. Um, in this case, uh, you will just be hitting a wall or hitting an object and then getting a Boolean information from this sensor. Um, we are gonna be covering how to use the distance sensor uh, and then comparing the distance that you're getting to stop before you hit a wall. So for instance, on the animation on the right, you can see that the robot starts moving forward. And then once it's detected that it's a specific distance away from the wall, in this case, something close to 0 0.5 meters, um, uh, it's gonna stop and just wait there. So let's see how we can program something like this um, in VEX code. The easiest way to do this is to compare using if state. So all we're going to do is, as you can see on the blue box here, we are using the provided functions, which is sonar.distance, to get the distance from the ultrasonic sensor in this case. So then we're comparing that to uh, our set point, or the distance we want to be how far away from the wall. In this case, we've set it as 20 millimeters. And if the distance is greater than that, it means that we can keep moving forward. So we are going to set the motors to spin forward, or we're going to implement an else statement, uh, which means that if the distance is uh, lower than that, we're going to make the motor stop. So let's take a look at, um, again, what this means conceptually. In simulating, this means uh, obtaining a signal from the distance sensor, obtaining the distance. And then we're implementing a switch, which is effectively an if statement. Um, and if the distance is greater than one, or in this case, one meter or whatever distance we want to set, we're going to be set the motor speeds uh, to positive, in this case, positive 100 to make the robot move forward. Or if its distance is less than one, we're going to be setting it to zero to make the robot stop. In this particular uh, model, you can see that we have an input section, which is our sensor. We have a portion which corresponds to our control logic. Um, and then finally, we have an output portion. And these three um, portions can be mapped directly to our autonomy components, which are perception, control, and actuation. So let's take a look at. Um, a simulating demonstration or a simulation and how to avoid a wall. So in here we can see our simulating model on the left uh, where we have our distance sensor, our switch and our motors. And here we have a scope which is just gonna be showing us the distance output of the distance sensor and then the motor commands that we are sending to the robot. So we can directly run the simulation and we can see in real time how um, the distance sensor is reacting um, to, the, to the input. So in this case, we can see that the distance is being reduced because you're approaching the wall. And then once we get to that one meter mark, you can see the motor command um, here um, that it's gone back to zero because we want the robot to stop before it hits that wall. And then we can also see that the distance output from the distance sensor stops at around one meter. So I can, I can see that we have a question here on the, on the chat. Uh, it says, if your sensor um, senses that you have gone too far, then can the sensor tell the robot to back up until the one distance away from the object? So um, in this particular implementation, um, we are just looking to stop before we hit the wall. However, farther down the webinar, we will be covering um, 
some other algorithms which are going to take into account moving backwards. So going back to our presentation, um, we are going to see that um, in this case, our control logic was a very simple if statement or a switch. Um, but do we know what type of control system this is? So in order to explain that a little bit further, since this is the first time that we're using a sensor, we're going to have a brief control system intermission uh, where we're just going to talk about the different control system approaches. So there are mainly two types of control systems and they generally depend on the loop type. So control systems are generally classified as open loop and open loop system means that there is no sensing. So let's say that you want to create a or you are in a car and you want to travel at a certain speed. Um, if you are the driver, you might just have to hold the accelerator pedal at a certain position to maintain that speed. Um, but if you have no access to any more information than that, you might not know whether or not you are at that speed. Um, so open loop algorithms generally means that there is no sensors being used with them. Whereas in the second type of uh, control system type is a closed loop type. And this is generally um, the type of control algorithm that we just saw, which uses information from the sensors. So if you are programming something like a car cruise control, you're going to have to know what is the actual speed that the car is traveling at. And you might do this by using a speed sensor of some sorts. And by monitoring that speed or having that monitor speed, you can change your control logic to make sure that in this case, you can maintain that speed. And as the question that we just got asked, you can also use that measure speed to make sure that you don't go above or below that set speed. Um, closed loop controls are uh, referred to as a um, concept called feedback. And feedback basically means that your control algorithm or your control logic has some external information of the environment. Um, this is why closed loop controls are also commonly referred to as feedback controls. And you might ask yourself, well, is this always necessary? Or why would I want to use closed loop controls? Um, the reason is that you might want to react to disturbances or changes in the environment. Um, closed loop controls will account for robot interactions that are difficult to predict. And we're going to take the example of a robot moving by itself. So in this case, we are programming this robot on the right. Um, we want it to move to a certain location. So we use um, some sort of state machine that has a dead reckoning sequence on it. And this works great because we can test it and we can make sure that we have the right uh, temporal logic implemented so that we can achieve whatever position we're looking to get. However, um, if in this case the environment changes and now we have to push an object along with moving our robot, uh, we've introduced a disturbance to the system. So because perhaps we now have more weight that we have to push forward, uh, the same amount of time to push the object forward might not be enough to get to the desired position. So this means that an open loop control approach such as um, temporal dead reckoning sequence might not be enough. So let's take a look at the control system approaches we've used so far. So like we just mentioned, we covered the dead reckoning sequence. Um, this is a type of control logic that is open loop because it has no sensors that are being involved in the process. And then we covered um, how to avoid a wall or how to stop before hitting a wall by using a distance sensors. And in this case, we implemented a very simple uh, on-off control logic. But in this case, this was closed loop because we had some information from the environment. 
Now, in the closed loop example, we can see that we have some feedback. So in this case, the sensor information from the distance sensor is the feedback to our system. So if we were to want to improve our initial dead reckoning sequence, uh, we are gonna have to introduce some sort of feedback to our system. So what would this feedback be? Um, Well, perhaps we can use some of the sensors that are already available to us. So uh, encoders in this case are gonna be really useful for things like navigation. So we are gonna close the loop now by introducing how to use encoders, in this case, one or more encoders, in order to perform a closed loop control to control the navigation of our robot. This brings us to our autonomy task number four, which is uh, navigating with encoders. Now, before uh, we go over this task, uh, we can take a small break and we can cover one or two questions um, from the Q&A. Um, one where are the models going to be? Um, so we are gonna be emailing, um, the models will have a, a submission on our MathWorks website. Uh, we're also gonna be emailing all the registered participants of the webinar with a link to find the models, the presentation, the VEX code, and all of that. Um, we also have a question that says, you're still using time, Will this affect the ability to do parallel tasks? Uh, that's a great question actually. So um, yes, we are still using time, but if you are using the time in the, within a state machine, then that does not affect your ability to perform parallel tasks um, because you can keep track of different states. So you can have, for instance, program two separate state machines each of which keeps track of its own time for a different purpose. In this case, you might have two separate state machines running simultaneously, one for the robot uh, overall motion, and one for, let's say, uh, a gripper position or lifting an arm up and down. Okay, so um, with those two questions answered, we are gonna go ahead and resume to our autonomy task uh, number four, which is gonna be uh, closed loop navigation, in this case, navigating uh, using or with encoders. Now, um, navigating with encoders just means that now we're gonna create a closed loop algorithm in which we're gonna be comparing the encoder values instead of the time that has passed since the robot first started moving. And the procedure for these is gonna be um, reading the values from the encoder first, so obtaining that information. Uh, then we are gonna compare to some desired counts. So generally the information that encoders give us is how many counts or ticks um, have transcurred since, um, since the encoder first started counting rotations. And then we're gonna set the motor speeds or the robot velocity. And if necessary, if we are starting a task completely new and we want, we can reset the encoder counts, this is optional. And we're gonna repeat this for every, uh, every sample time of our algorithm. So on the algorithm here on the right, uh, we can see in the code that the first thing that we're doing is we are setting our velocities uh, and then we are acquiring the counts from the encoder, which we are doing within the same if statement. So we are acquiring the counts from the encoder, which you can see in the function encoder.rotation and we are asking to get the rotation in units of degrees. Uh, 
And then we are checking the position against, in this case, two times 360, which corresponds to two rotations of the encoder. Um, and if the encoder has gone through two rotations, um, then we're gonna exit uh, and we're gonna stop the motors. But if we haven't yet achieved um, the two rotations, we are gonna set the motor, the motors, both of the motors to spin forward. Um, now, we've implemented this using an if statement, but you can, instead of stopping your motors, can implement this on a state machine and just tell your state machine to increase its state. So you can uh, navigate using the encoder, and then once you get to a certain position, you can move to a different task altogether. Now, with the addition of the new VEX EDR B5 hardware, um, there is an easier way to navigate with encoders. Um, so if you are writing an algorithm to navigate with encoders using a B5 smart motor, there is specific functionality that you can take advantage of to make your programming a lot easier. Um, in this case, uh, they already come with a pre-programmed closed loop control algorithm. So you can just um, set the desired number of rotations and then the motors will, will basically travel or, or travel up to those amount of rotations and stop. Now here on the left, I've included a screen capture of uh, some of the most useful commands that are available for smart motors. And that is um, start rotate four. This means that from wherever position a motor is at, is gonna rotate for however many rotations you tell it to. In this case, it can be in degrees or you can change the rotation units to something different like encoder count. Um, now, this start rotation four is relative, which means that from whenever you call this function, it's gonna move, let's say, two rotations. Uh, whereas we have another function available that is start to rotate two, and this function keeps track of the previous displacement of the motor, which means that it's gonna keep track of the absolute rotations of the motor. And if you can also take advantage of this function, uh, but we're gonna be using start rotate four because it's relative and sometimes it can be a little bit more useful. So you can see on our code on the right that we uh, set our motors to start to rotate for two rotations, in this case, two times 360. And we are giving them to do this at a maximum velocity of 50%. Uh, now, in order to be able to progress to a next, uh, maybe state in a state machine or a next portion in our sequence of algorithms, if we're doing sequential programming, we're gonna have to check if the motor is still spinning and we're gonna have to do this by implementing uh, a while loop. So there are a couple of ways to do this. And if you're doing this in a state machine, um, you can use this as your exit condition. And in this case, um, VEX has provided us with functions that we can call to determine if the motors are still spinning. So if the, these motors are, uh, these functions are whatever the motor name is, that is spinning. So in this case, we're gonna be checking for both motors and see if both motors are still spinning, then we're gonna wait. And after they both stop spinning, then we're gonna move forward to the next sequence in our test. So how would we go about wrapping this type of code in a state machine? Uh, well, the idea here is to use those is spinning statements to wait for the motors to reach the position and then change states. So you can see the example in the screen here. Um, so for instance, we're gonna start in our state zero and uh, we are gonna try to achieve two rotations, two full rotations, and we're gonna wait until two full rotations are achieved. And when the two motors stop or they stop spinning, then we're gonna move on to the next state. And on the next state, we are gonna rotate. So we're gonna change the rotations of our left motor and say that we want uh, negative two rotations or negative two times 360 degrees. 
and then we can implement the same type of logic to exit onto our next state. So let's take a look at how navigating with encoders would look like um, in graphical model. So this is a Simulink model. And as you can see, we're gonna be uh, using our inputs. Um, it's gonna be from our encoder. In this case, we're gonna pick one of the encoders, the left encoder, and we're gonna be getting the counts or the ticks out of it. And we're gonna be feeding that into what, in this case, is our supervisory logic chart or flow chart uh, that is gonna be outputting uh, the velocity command that we're gonna be sending to our motors. And finally, we're gonna send that command to our actuators via the motor block outputs. Um, so what is inside of this uh, flow chart is two states, one of which is moving forward, that sets the command to a positive command, and then we're gonna stop uh, when we have reached two rotations. In this case, the counts are greater than or equal than two times 316 ticks. And we're gonna stop that. So let's take a look at how we can visualize this and understand why it's important to implement closed loop controls. So in here we have our same um, playground visualization on the right. Um, we can see our Simulink model on the left and uh, we have added this scope to be able to plot uh, the counts of the encoder and the command that we're sending to the motors. In this case, we're gonna run the simulation again and what we're trying to achieve is we try to uh, move forward a certain distance and then stop based uh, only on the encoder counts. So now we can see the robot moving forward. We can see that the command is steady at 70. And when we reach the desired uh, 720 counts, then the robot stops moving. So what a, why is this uh, type of algorithm important? Um, well, we know that we can use the encoders and use if statements. Um, we know that we can also implement a closed loop controller for our navigation by using uh, more modern functionality on the V5 smart motors. And we can do this by using absolute rotations or relative rotations. And we can also integrate multiple movements using state machines and a closed loop algorithm. The pros of using encoders are that we can use the encoder information directly uh, and that it's relatively easy to program uh, if we're just doing um, if statements. Uh, the cons of, in, of you know, using something like uh, navigation based on encoders is that Thinking in terms of individual motors and sensors might be difficult, especially if you start having multiple motors and multiple encoders, or if you start having encoders positioned in uh, difficult parts of your robot that don't necessarily correspond to another motor. Um, so what can we do instead? Um, this is gonna lead us into our next autonomy task, which is uh, it might be easier to control a robot if we can, instead of trying to control individual motors, we can try to think in terms of position and orientation of the robot. So that brings us to our autonomy task number five, which is uh, determining position. Um, Determining the robot position uh, means that we're gonna try to estimate uh, where the robot is located in the field. And we're gonna use the wheel encoders uh, to be able to derive this information, but we're also gonna need uh, some information regarding the robot geometry. Um, so the robot geometry specifically, how your wheels are set up, 
and where they are set up is going to play a major role on odometry, which is what we call being able to derive robot position using encoder data. And after we've implemented, implemented some odometry, uh, we will be able to determine what the distance traveled is. So an odometer is um, generally a device used for measuring the distance traveled by a vehicle. And uh, it is mostly based on the wheels of a vehicle. So in this case, we can determine how much distance we've traveled because uh, we know that one rotation of a wheel uh, is gonna correspond to a distance of the equal to the circumference of that wheel. And the circumference is a simple equation that is based on the radius of the wheel. So we know that two times the number pi times the radius of the wheel uh, is gonna give us the distance traveled in one rotation of the wheel. Now, if we have multiple rotations, we're gonna have to know how many times the wheel is rotating. So we're gonna have to multiply the number of wheel rotations by the circumference. And if we are using an encoder to capture this information, we're gonna to have to take into account some encoder properties too, which might be how many counts or how many ticks you're gonna have uh, per one rotation of your wheel. So the final equation um, is gonna be dependent on your encoder information, which is how many ticks you have per rotation, the circumference of your wheel, and you're gonna be able to provide the total encoder ticks and derive the distance traveled using that equation. So in the end, we are gonna be creating a function that's called an odometer or an odometry calculation that's gonna take in the encoder ticks um, from our sensor and it's gonna give us the distance traveled of our robot. Now, it is important to know that depending on your robot design, uh, this math might be different and there are a lot of different ways you can place your wheels on your robot. Uh, in this case, in our simulation environment, we're using a differential drive. And that is also what we will be covering in our odometer example. But you can also um, look at implementing this for different type of wheel configurations uh, that are common in the VAX competition, like triple omni wheels um, or mechanical wheels. So how do we go about calculation, calculating the distance um, based on the encoder counts? Well, we are gonna need uh, the information from both the left and right um, wheels. So we're gonna need the distance traveled from our left wheel and the distance traveled from our right wheel. And we are gonna derive this using the equation that we saw on the previous slide. Uh, once we have those, we can add them up and get an average, in this case, divide them by two. And this is gonna give us our total distance traveled by, in this case, the center of the robot. Now, in the same fashion, we can estimate the robot orientation by also using the distance traveled by the left and the right wheels. Um, and the orientation of the robot in this case is gonna be uh, the angle or the rotation uh, relative to its starting position. So the heading is gonna correspond to this angle um, relative to this starting position. And to calculate it, the equation is gonna be subtracting the left wheel travel from the right wheel travel and dividing it by the axle length. And the axle length in our case is nothing but the distance uh, that separates uh, the left wheel from the right. So now that we have a conceptual understanding of what the equations are and how we should go about calculating the position and orientation, we are gonna give you a code example of how you might go about programming something like this. Uh, there is three main um, portions of code that you should take into account. Uh, the first one is you must acquire the encoder counts in this case, uh, if you're using something like VEX Coding Studio, we already seen the function uh, for acquiring encoder. Encoder rotations in this case, which is the encoder name dot rotation. Uh, 
and then we're going to ask to get the rotations in degrees and to obtain the total number of left wheel rotations we're going to divide those degrees by 360 which is how many degrees there are in one rotation then we're going to calculate the wheel travel or the total wheel travel and this is where we're going to multiply the rotations times the circumference of the wheel so we've now in the purple box multiplied the left rotations times 2 times pi times the radius of the wheel and finally we're going to calculate the distance traveled on the orientation by implementing the equations that we saw before so left wheel travel plus right wheel travel divided by 2 and uh, for heading it's going to be right wheel travel minus left wheel travel divided by axle length and now we have the information that we were looking for we have distance and we have heading and we can use this in the rest of our algorithm to take decisions so what are the pros of having this information is that it's easier to understand you can map multiple components within your robot to a particular position and orientation and also when we start developing more advanced control algorithms uh, they are going to be easier to develop we have abstracted some useful information from our sensors. The cons of this is that it does involve some extra programming um, and that the positions that we calculate using an odometer are going to be relative to the starting position and they're not going to be absolute positions within the competition field. So now let's take a look at how we might implement uh, odometry on a graphical modeling environment like Simian. So the idea is to get the information from both of the encoders and transform it into distance and heading. Um, so we are going to be looking at what, um, in this case, is behind this subsystem or this block. Um, and it's the, exactly the same equations that we've seen so far. And as you can see on the right of the screen, odometry uh, relates to the autonomy component of perception. So this is information that we're going to be using down the line to perform our supervision and control of our robot. Um, in this case, the perception means translating the encoder counts into distance and heading. And um, this is the simulink model that corresponds to the equations or the math that we saw in the previous slides. So let's take a look at um, this robot odometry that we just showed you in action. So does, does this actually work? Um, so in here we have our simulink model and we're gonna open up this scope. And as we run this simulink model, you can see that within the odometry subsystem, we have exactly the equations that we've shown you so far. So we're using the circumference of the wheel and we're using the encoder counts to ultimately calculate the left wheel travel and the right wheel travel and convert those into a average distance travel and estimated heading. So if we run that simulink model, um, we're going to be able to see on the visualization on the right, that the robot will start moving forward and we can see the distance increasing and uh, it's going to increase up to around one meter and then at one meter the robot starts turning and we can see now that the heading is decreasing to a position of around negative 100 degrees. So this is just a brief visual, visualization of how the odometry can help you understand where your robot is oriented at in the field. So that brings us to our autonomy task uh, number six, which is controlling the position. Uh, and we're gonna be doing this by using a PID controller. So you might ask, what is a PID controller? Well, a PID controller is a particular type of a closed loop control algorithm 
we already know that a closed loop control algorithm means that we're going to be using some sort of sensors. And to cover the naming of this controller, it, PID stands for Proportional Integral and Derivative Control. Before we go into the specifics of a PID controller, we're going to cover why you want to use a PID control. And there's two main reasons. One, if you're controlling your robot motion, you're going to be getting faster response and better accuracy. Uh, in this particular video, you can see that we are implementing the traditional type of on-off control that we've seen so far which means that we've only implemented a sort of logical statement, like an if statement, to determine whether the distance traveled is greater than one meter in this case or not. And what happens if you implement this type of control is that the robot will start, it will move, and you will see that it landed um, relatively far away from the actual one meter mark. Now, this is called overshoot. Uh, so basically, we landed too far from where we want it to be. Uh, PID controller, on the other hand, because it's smarter than a simple logical statement, uh, will take into account what the distance is to the target location and maybe reduce the speed on the motors so that the robot won't go too far past the one meter mark in this case. So if we can see this example of the robot on the right, we can see that by implementing a PID controller, we have greatly reduced that overshoot of that rock. And if you are using this for competition, this might make the difference between you being able to uh, be lined up with an object and being able to pick it up or just missing it altogether. So how can we implement a PID controller? Uh, we're gonna be covering in particular for the purpose of navigation. So we just, uh, we've covered already how to use a state machine or a simple logical statement to uh, navigate by using on-off control. Uh, now we're gonna see how we can modify this type of model to use a PID controller instead. And if you're doing it in, in Simulink or if we're conceptually looking at what must be done, um, it means that we are gonna change the model in this case to process the signal using a PID control algorithm that requires as an input the error. So the first thing that we must do to implement a PID controller is calculate the error relative to a desired reference. Um, now a reference also is also commonly called a set point. So this basically means uh, the point where we wanna land if we're moving forward or the uh, reference we want to achieve within our control system. So in this case, I've, in this model, set a reference for a set point of 360 or two revolutions or two times 180, since our encoder had 180 counts per revolution. And then after that, you're gonna be able to calculate the control command by feeding in that error into our PID control. Um, all of these models are available, so you're welcome to uh, look at the material after the workshop and ask questions or further try to understand a PID. So now we need to understand what is inside a PID controller. How does this command get calculated based on the error or the distance to that reference? Now, a PID control algorithm is nothing but a mathematical equation um, that is based on the integral and the derivative of the error. So in this case, it's a summation of uh, a couple of um, coefficients, which are um, Kp, Ki, and Kd, uh, that multiply either the error itself, the integral of the error, or the derivative of the error. And if this is a little bit difficult to understand, um, if you were to make a diagram out of it, it will look something like this, where you have three different signal paths that are, uh, that are summed, that are added together in order to create a command that is the combination of three different paths, one corresponding to an 
a signal that has the integral of the error, one corresponding to a signal that has the derivative, and one that just applies um, a gain or multiplies the error directly. Now these kp, ki, and kd coefficients um, are gonna be what determine the performance of your controller. So these are gonna be the things that determine whether your robot performs better than let's say a simple on-off controller or whether these um, yeah, coefficients are not gonna be set properly and might instead hinder the performance of your robot. So how do we determine the value for these coefficients? There's two main ways to do it. And this is generally through simulations and through testing. So there's no um, one approach that is gonna give you the right answer. Most often times, if you have a model of your robot, you can simulate it and come up with good values. Uh, but most of the times you're eventually gonna have to test them and make sure that they're working properly. So let's take a quick demo of um, what it might look like to use uh, PID for encoder navigation. So if we run the Simulink model, we see that we've set up our target counts uh, for the, however many counts of the encoder we wanna reach. And we have logged the data from the counts of the encoder and the command. Now different to the original encoder navigation algorithm that we use using an on-off controller, you can now see that the counts on the bottom or the distance we traveled has a curvature to it. Now this is what the PID controller uh, is gonna look like because we are using the derivative on the integral of the error. And this means that you can slow down as you approach the set point that you wanna reach. And this also means that you can speed up when you are really far away from. So this is just a brief plot that will show you how you can achieve um, more interesting and high performance behaviors by using a PID controller than by using traditional on-off control. And if you're interested in how to change the coefficients, you will see that if you double click on the PID controller blog, you can directly change the proportional, integral, and derivative coefficients of the algorithm. So what are other uses of PID controllers? Um, well, in this case, since we've already derived odometry for our system, we can control directly position or the distance. So you can see that in this Simulink model, that's called distance PID. Instead of using directly the encoder counts, we are processing them with our odometry algorithm. And we are using a PID to control now the distance traveled in meters specifically. And we can do this because we are also processing our command by something called an arcade control module. And this basically just means that for a differential drive robot, um, we are gonna be telling it uh, to move forward and backwards and then to turn right or left instead of setting the individual motor speeds. Um, but the idea here is that we can use the odometry to control distance instead of um, using the encoder counts directly. And the same goes for heading control, since we've already derived um, the heading or the orientation of our robot, we can use that information directly and give it a target, a target heading or a target orientation, in this case, something like 90 degrees, and then run it through a PID controller to uh, affect the robot rotation uh, and reach this command. Other uses for PID controllers um, that are common in the competition are holding arms in place. So because you can lift an arm with or without an object, that in, involves a disturbance in the system and PID controllers are gonna be able to use that environment information or the position of the arm in order to make sure that you're always lifting to the correct location. Um, 
other uses are following lines, so line following algorithms, uh, maintaining the orientation of certain robot components, for instance, for uh, shooting robots, uh, or robots that have shooters that have to be kept at a specific height or orientation. And in general, PID controllers will help you prevent overshoot of any system. Um, now, we are not gonna be covering specifically how you would hand code a PID controller because this is a bit out of scope of this workshop, uh, but we are gonna give you some recommendations if you do wanna code your own PID controller. Uh, you should probably start by using existing PID libraries and it is, will be most beneficial if you wrap this or call them within state machines to ensure that they are called and updated at a specific sample time. Um, since we've covered state machines, it's gonna be uh, very similar to using smart motor functionality, um, which is also available to you. So smart motors uh, use a version of a PID controller to be able to control their rotations. So if you're interested in doing some closed loop control and maybe don't wanna go all the way to writing your own PID controllers, you might wanna consider just using the functionality available on smart motors. And finally, this slide will contain a couple of resources um, for you. There is a VEX wiki, which has very good detailed explanation of PID controllers and how the different coefficients affect performance. Um, there is a couple of teams that have experience and have given insight and thoughts. There's a programming guide by George Gillard, and I've included a simple C and C++ library that you can use. And there's also extensive posts about this on the VEX forum that you can refer to. That brings us to our last autonomy task, which is detecting objects. And detecting objects is important because uh, the initial locations of the objects are usually constant. So on, on the VAX competition fields, um, you can usually within your autonomous mode algorithms, know exactly where the objects are gonna be so that you can move them. Um, and then finding these objects along while your robot is moving through the field will, have, will help you derive the robot position, uh, your absolute position relative to the field. Now, detecting objects uh, relates to the autonomy component of your robot perception. And the reason is, let's say we have this red object, we might have previous information that tells us that the red object is gonna be located exactly at some distance from the right wall, or that the blue object is exactly in the middle of the field and a specific distance from the bottom wall. How can you identify objects uh, with your VEX hardware? So the VEX V5 now has a vision sensor and the vision sensor identify objects by color and you can use a utility to calibrate the different colors uh, that you wanna detect and it will provide you with different information of these objects. You can see the utility in here in screen. In this case, I merely used it to uh, threshold or find a red box. Um, note that you can also use contact and ultrasonic sensors to detect objects. If you are keeping track of your position in the field and you know it, you have a rough sense of where you're navigating to, uh, an estimated robot position, you can use contact sensors to determine whether there's an object in front of you or whether you've touched something and you might know that that is actually an object. Um, the important portion of uh, der deriving inf information from uh, objects is um, what information is gonna be valuable for your control algorithm. So in this case, we have all of these functions that we can use directly from VEX, um, but some of the things that you might consider is, is a particular object in sight um, or is a particular object at a certain position, does that mean that I can actually reach for it and grab it? Or maybe whether we know that if we see more than one object in sight, we are in a different region of the field. And um, VEX Coding Studio will provide you functions for things like the ID, so which color it is, um, the origin or the center relative to the image, and also things like the width, height, uh, which you can use to determine how far away an object is and also whether 
object exists right now or is, is found and the angle of it. In our case, uh, we're gonna show you a simple visualization of how you can find an object depending on the angle and then stop to identify. So you can see here on screen that our robot is pointing in the direction, that our robot is pointing in a particular direction and then it stops when it finds the, the object that it wants to look at. Uh, this was a very simple algorithm that uses a logical condition and it just stops when the specified angle is at specific range. Um, so let's take a look at what the Simulink model for this looks like. We can see that um, the perception component, in this case, which is the left-hand portion of the model, uh, does three different things. It obtains the sensor data, in this case, data from all of the objects, so all of the objects that are within the vision of the robot. It identifies the colors, and then it extracts, in this case, the angle for the relevant information before sending it to our supervisory um, state machine. So let's take a look at how we might use this information in a state machine. Uh, in this case, we are waiting for three seconds and then we are rotating. And if we see that there is a red object within uh, 10 degrees of the center of the field of vision of our robot, then we're gonna stop. And then it's gonna go into the next state, which is gonna wait for three seconds. and then it's gonna to try to find the green object. And after we find the green object, we're gonna to try to find the blue object, and then it's gonna keep doing this uh, indefinitely. So let's take a look at how this might look at in Simulink. And for that, we've got a video. Um, so you can see here that our robot goes to the find green state immediately and then starts moving. Once it finds the green, it goes into the find blue, waits for three seconds, and then tries to find the red, finds the red and waits for three seconds. So this in itself uh, might not seem very useful, but it gives you an idea of how you can detect objects and react to them. And that brings us to the end of our individual autonomy tasks and brings us to our final complete autonomous solution, uh, in which case our goal here is to navigate, find, and move uh, the blue and green objects to the target locations. So much like in a VEX field, we wanna move, um, we're gonna be using uh, all of our autonomy components, perception, supervision, control, and actuation, to move uh, the blue object to the blue target and the green object to the green target. And this means that we're gonna to have to do this by completing a series of tasks. So what are the tasks or we're gonna list them out uh, to see how we, one way that we can achieve this. So in this case, we're gonna start by rotating our robot so that it faces the red wall. Then we're gonna to try to find the red wall. And after we find the red wall, we're gonna to try to track that wall all the way down until we find the red object. So we know that a specific distance from that red object is the center of the field, which is where the blue object is located. So after we find the red object, we're gonna rotate and face the blue object. Then we're gonna move straight. We're gonna push the blue object. And we're gonna know that we've pushed the blue object into the blue target field uh, by checking um, with our distance sensor, how far away from the green wall we are. Then we're gonna back up, we're gonna move back, we're gonna rotate to find the green object, and finally, we are gonna push the green object all the way to the green field. Now, this is what the integration of a full autonomous algorithm will look like in Simulink. Um, we can see that on the left, we have all of our sensors and how we are processing this data. This is the perception portion of the algorithm. We have our distance sensor, which is gonna give us some range information of the things that are in front of our robot. We have our vision sensor in this case, 
that's going to give us information about the objects in the field. And then we have our left and right encoders that are going to give us odometry so that we can control the distance and heading. On the right hand, we have uh, the motors and the actuators and an arcade module to more easily control um, the forward and rotation of the robot. And in the middle, we can see our state machine. And in this state machine in particular, we're going to have both our supervision and our control algorithms. So let's take a look at this state machine. Um, in this case, as we mentioned before, it is useful to use um, libraries or functions to implement your PID controllers. So we've used that. And you can see that we have called, if we start from the top, all of these is our supervision. We start by turning, uh, as we listed out in our tasks. So we're going to use our heading PID controller to turn until we reach a heading of negative 60 degrees. Once we reach a heading of negative 60 degrees, we're going to find the wall. And then we're going to start moving forward until we find the wall at a range of 0 0.5 meters. And then we're going to go into a tracking wall algorithm that's going to move forward and turn right depending on the value of the distance sensor. Um, you can see after the track wall state that we're going to identify the red object. And that's going to lead us to pushing the blue object straight into its field. Um, and then we're going to back up. We're going to find the green object. And at last, on the bottom right corner of the state machine, we can see that we're going to push the green object. So let's take a look at the demonstration for what this is going to look like if we are trying to keep track of our states and see how they are going to be relating to the robot behavior. So here we can see that the robot is turning left. Then it tries to find the wall. We're in the find wall state. We quickly move to the track wall state. And we keep tracking the wall, moving forward until we find that red object, in which case we are turning towards the blue object and pushing it forward. And the robot will grab the blue object, push it forward, and then stop once it's close to the green wall. Then it's going to back up a specific distance, in this case 0 0.5 meters. And it's going to start looking for the green object. And once it's in the center of the robot, it will try to push it forward into the green target location. So now we're going to go into the summary of what we've learned today. We went through a couple of common autonomy tasks. We covered moving for time. We covered dead reckoning, avoiding obstacles, navigation with encoders, how to determine the robot position in the field, how to control the position, and also how to detect objects. And within this, we also learned what temporal logic was, how to implement state machines, and how to implement PID controllers and why they're useful. This type of tasks mapped out to the four components of autonomous mode algorithms, which are perception, supervision, control, and actuation. So this is going to help us program our robot to sense, decide, and command its own uh, actuators. And we were able to see how we could put together and integrate an algorithm using a state machine that will complete all the tasks that we were looking for. In this case, it was scoring a blue on a green object. Uh, the learning outcomes of this session were that we learned how to use sensors and actuators. We learned how to determine and um, estimate robot position and orientation. And, and we also learned how to implement common controllers like on-off controllers, PID controllers, and temporal logic. Um, and finally, we integrated a full autonomous mode algorithm using a state machine. In the slides, I've also included um, further free learning material. So you can go to our MathWorks spec support page, and in there you'll find uh, things like the mobile robotics training, 
um, which also covers uh, things like line following, which we didn't cover in this webinar, more obstacle avoidance. It goes into great detail into how to program PID and how different coefficients affect the behavior of the control system and path navigation using state machines. Uh, I've also included here um, our video series, which contains video tutorials for mobile robotics and hardware programming. And we also have um, the VEX MATLAB and Simulink curriculum and our support for the VEX EDR hardware. That is all that we have for you guys today. Um, now we can go back to looking at some of the questions that you guys have asked, and you can feel free to ask some other questions since we have around 20 minutes to cover questions. If you have further questions after the workshop, or if you review the material later and have questions on how the simulations are implemented, feel free to send us an email to passcompetitions at mathworks.com. So we have a question from Jimmy that says, will you provide the examples including the C++ code or the simulating code or both? Um, we will be including both. We will be including um, BEX Coding Studio project files and the simulating models that we showed you today in the demonstrations. Uh, we have a question from uh, Caleb Smith. Um, how would I calculate the distance traveled for a robot with tank threads? Uh, the threads will be spread the length of the robot, but only have the motor on each side. Um, so to answer this question, um, you will likely use a very similar approach. So you will attach an encoder to whatever wheels are driving those tank threads and then you will derive uh, what type of distance will the robot cover over one rotation of that encoder or one rotation of the wheel that's driving the tank threads. We have another question from John. Can you explain what it means that the B5 motors have PID logic built in? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the new V5 motors actually have are a combination. So before you guys had motor drivers, encoders, and motors separately. Now the smart motors incorporate all those three components into one package, which means that the smart motors themselves have built-in encoders, motor drivers, and obviously the motor and the coils necessary to drive the shaft. So uh, they also have a small microcontroller in them that can keep track of the encoder counts and set the commands or the velocity to the motor and keep track of it and implements a closed loop control. We have another question from Vex IQ Team 2701. Could you use PID to get rid of drift in gyro sensors? Um, so not necessarily. That is that is not one of the main purpose of a PID algorithm. Um, there are there are other sensing algorithms that might help you eliminate some of the drift in gyro sensors. Um, some uh, estimators um, and you might have to involve other sensors other than just the gyro in order to eliminate the drift. Um, we have a question from Alex that says for calculating heading is axle length the distance between the inside edges of the wheels outside or other? That's a good question. Generally um, 
that would depend on your robot. It's likely going to be the distance uh, to the middle of the wheel or, or the part that's touching the ground. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions here. Are there general techniques to handle wheel slippage in odometry? calculations when rotations are made but the wheel hasn't gone the corresponding distance due to slip it that's a great question and yes so generally um, some algorithms will be able to keep track of slippage if you have multiple wheels that you are monitoring so um, that's similar to the traction control algorithm in a car where it can use um, the encoders or the ABS sensors on the wheels to control the traction of the rear wheels. I've also seen um, some VEX teams that will um, have additional wheels that they use only for their odometry. So instead of placing the encoder in the driven wheels, they will have an, a different wheel with the encoder set on it. And because that wheel is not being driven and it's only being dragged around, then that wheel will likely have less slippage or no slippage oil. Um, how would you calculate heading for a robot that turns around a point that is not the center of the robot, i.e. back end or swing? Um, that's a tricky question. You, um, that's gonna change the math that you're gonna be using to calculate the heading of your robot. You might have to perform some coordinate transformations is what it's called. Uh, but there are ways to 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 calculate um, the heading of your robot if your particular sensors or your driven wheels are not relative to the center of your robot. Um, Let's scroll all the way up to the answers. Um, Julia asked, is this using robot C? No, we did not use robot C. Um, the code that we showed you was, uh, uh, was done using VEX Coding Studio, which is the, the new platform developed specifically for VEX B5. Um, Um, Burak asked a question, wouldn't the lighting affect a color sensor through the water competition? That is a great question, Burak, and that is true. Um, the lighting will likely affect your color thresholding for your vision sensor. Um, that is something that you will have to try out. Feel free to let us know if you run into any conditions with this. What are some good programs that I can use to simulate code? So I am aware of only a couple. I know um, that Robomatter creates virtual worlds and that Robomesh also has an online tool that will also have virtual worlds where you can build using different VEX components. You can look into this if you're interested. Uh, Dave Vick asked earlier for VEX, if you had two motors moving one arm, how would you make them move in sync? Um, that's a good question. Um, you can invert the signal going to one motor and send it to the other if they're completely opposite. If not, then you might want to place different sensors on the motors and use the information from your sensors to make sure that they are moving in sync. And you can also implement uh, something like a single PID controller to control both motors. Um, 
for an example, um, I think earlier somebody asked if start rotate for or commands would be more appropriate for some examples. I think we maybe that was earlier. We covered we covered both. So we covered set velocity in the beginning, and then we also covered start rotate for. And we also covered the difference with the start rotate for and start rotate to. Um, I think um, we are cutting it pretty close to our scheduled time. Um, I think the questions have went down. Um, the, one of the last questions we have is, um, is there a specific reason why I use X times 360 degrees instead of just the rotations? No, there is no specific reason. I just uh, thought it would be easier to understand if I said how many rotations I want in total. Um, and then one last question, um, what exit conditions do you recommend using with PID? We have had issues in the past where the robot gets stuck in a while loop because it does not satisfy the ending condition. Uh, my recommendation would be use multiple exit conditions. So maybe include another sensor in there. Uh, I know that now with the new VEX V5 motors, you're also gonna be able to do things like monitor the load in the motor. So that's something that you might wanna look into. So if the robot is pushing a wall and it's stuck somewhere, you might be able to uh, understand that by looking at a higher load in the motors. I think that's all the questions that we're gonna take. Thank you very much everybody for attending. Uh, if you have any questions, please send us an email to passcompetitions at mathworks.com. Uh, you should be sending, uh, you should be receiving an email within the next week with the material we covered um, and the models, the code. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this. We hope that this was useful. Feel free to share this information with students, with other coaches. And uh, if you wanna try any of the simulations, uh, feel free to send us uh, your questions. You can go to the MathWorks uh, Bex Robotics website and you can ask for a free license so that you can uh, play around with the simulations and understand how to program these tasks. Thank you very much, everybody. We're going to go ahead and end the session. Um, like I said, feel free to send any further questions to past competitions at mathworks.com. Have a good night.